morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, wherever you're joining us from, and welcome to day three of the Arctic Institute's first ever conference. And without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Daria Shapovalov. Thank you so much, Roman, um, for your kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Roman, Lillian, and the team at the Arctic Institute uh, for inviting me and for putting this very interesting event together um, and for contributing to the ongoing work uh, of the Arctic Institute, which has been one of the main sources for me of the news and commentary on the Arctic affairs. And it's my pleasure and privilege to uh, be able to uh, speak to you today. Uh, and we already, as Roman said, had two days of exciting presentations and sessions. I uh, was able to drop in um, on many of them, sessions on uh, energy security, interplay between uh, energy and climate, the role of non-Arctic states, the uh, media narratives in the region, um, the framing of security in the region, uh, all uh, very interesting and definitely much needed after a two-year hiatus in um, in-person Arctic events. Um, and through my work, um, I probably um, researched all aspects of uh, Arctic energy and climate governance, indigenous rights in the context of energy development, petroleum licenses, renewable energy, environmental impact assessment, uh, black carbon, permafrost, or you name it, I've probably done it. Um, and this year, the Arctic Institute celebrated 10 years of is fruitful and productive work. And I have celebrated 10 years of my work on um, Arctic energy and environmental issues. So today I would like to reflect on uh, my personal experience as an Arctic researcher, but also take a step back and look at how the narrative of the Arctic energy and climate cooperation has changed since I started researching in this area. Uh, but before I begin as a Ukrainian scholar, I would like to express my solidarity with the Ukrainian people back home fighting so bravely against the Russian aggression, those who have been internally displaced, those who, those who have been forced to leave the country. Um, it's not a situation in Ukraine, it is not a Ukrainian conflict, it is an open um, war and being an Arctic Ukrainian scholar has definitely been quite a unique experience for me. Um, I had to correct people um, countless times at conferences who would mistake me for uh, a Russian scholar. I have a Russian surname. Um, I was very conflicted when the um, international cooperation just went on after the annexation of Crimea, where I'm from. I was glad as an Arctic scholar that the cooperation went on so smoothly because I'm all for Arctic cooperation and development. But as a Crimean person, I did feel a bit betrayed. Um, and since the start of the war, my life, my family and friends' life has changed forever, but my professional life has changed too. I cannot go on with cooperation with uh, my Russian colleagues who are friends, former collaborators, former co-authors. I cannot really enter Russia for conferences or events because I probably tweeted enough for, for a couple of prison sentences. Um, and without minimizing the tragedy of thousands of people of the senseless war. Another victim um, today is Arctic science and Arctic diplomacy. And it's uh, difficult to think that just four years ago, I was sitting in Moscow at an event organized by the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office um, with students from the Moscow State University discussing how we could make the science cooperation more productive and, and bring down barriers. And just yesterday at this conference, we were discussing the potential of nuclear war. So I hope and I believe that the Arctic research community will survive and overcome this division and the setbacks brought by the war. And I know for me, there is definitely a long road ahead in redefining my role and place in Arctic research as well. But let's uh, take a look uh, at the last 10 years. Um, my interest in the Arctic first started during my LLM studies in, in Groningen, and uh, we had a seminar on polar governance. And I never really thought about the Arctic before that. I am from Yalta, which is a small and very warm town, and Arctic could have been the moon. It was so remote and so far. 
Um, in the course of my work, I have met some amazing people, and I would like to take this moment to just praise the Arctic research community. If anyone ever asks me, I say Arctic research community is the best crowd. My first ever conference was in ICAS, an International Congress of Arctic Social Sciences in Prince George in Canada. Uh, I have met there and ever since so many anthropologists, lawyers, sociologists, political scientists, glaciologists, marine biologists, um, each and every one of them, um, interesting, excited about their area of research, willing to discuss it and exchange ideas in a friendly and open way. And it's quite a change from law conferences, I'll tell you that. Um, and we have got the Arctic Institute, we have uh, the Arctic Yearbook, an excellent publication. We have so many acronyms. We have ICAS, APEX, UARTIC, SCAR, AMAP, ACAP, SDWG. I don't think any other area of research has that many acronyms. And I think it makes us a very exclusive club um, when no uh, outsider can ever understand what we're talking about. So again, 10 years back, 2012, I'm a master's student. Um, there was a conference on EU-Russia energy law cooperation. There was a panel on Arctic energy focused, of course, on oil and gas. We're not even talking about Arctic renewables at that stage. Um, there is commercial drilling about to begin on the Prirozomne rig, the first offshore oil uh, to flow from an Arctic offshore field. Oil price is quite high. Uh, there are talks from all of the security commentators on the potential conflict, the incoming World War III over the Arctic resources, despite many uh, other commentators talking about a very orderly process provided by the international law of the sea. And the dust has quite settled after the titanium flag has been planted on the North Pole five years prior. Um, but there are still debates in the EU, some in the parliament, proposing moratorium on Arctic oil drilling, despite the EU having no legal say on the licenses, despite the EU importing a large part of its oil and gas from Russia and Norway. Cooperation between Russia and the EU in the energy sector is very active. Russia pulled out of the Energy Charter Treaty a few years before that, so there's a need to redesign the paradigm uh, for mutual investment protection in energy. Statoil signs its cooperation agreement with Rosneft, Yamal LNG starting construction involving a number of foreign partners. Shell attempts its first drilling season um, in the Alaskan waters, but they're drilling rate Kuluk runs aground and has to be towed away. 2013, and there is the first trouble on the horizon as 31 Greenpeace activists are detained in Russia after an attempt to mount the Prirozlomne oil rig in the Kara Sea, leading to an international dispute with the Netherlands in the Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. But at the same time, the cooperation in the Arctic Council is thriving. Sweden hosts a ministerial in Kiruna um, for the Arctic Council. It establishes a task force on black carbon and methane, highlighting the need to adopt a polar code for Arctic shipping. Sergei Lavrov is there thanking the Swedish hosts for their hospitality, saying, we have no doubts that the future of Arctic region will define notions like peace, sustainable development, close cooperation and strong Arctic Council. The Council facilitates the signature of the international agreement for cooperation on marine oil pollution preparedness and response leading in the following years to enhanced offshore safety, joint exercises, exploration of best practices and standards uh, for offshore energy activities. In the following year, 2014, I start my PhD in Aberdeen. My research is on Arctic offshore oil and gas and whether international environmental law is effective enough to protect the Arctic from climate change and from oil spills. My world turns over a little bit with uh, Crimea annexation. Canada boycotted one Arctic Council meeting, but the cooperation went ahead smoothly after that. Europe and the US adopt sanctions, including prohibition of um, financing and cooperating technically for the Arctic offshore petroleum product project. But at the same time, the first shipment comes from the Prior Zlomna oil rig to the European ports. So nothing really new to see here. We see the history uh, repeating itself again. And there is a narrative of Arctic exceptionalism that is re-entering the discourse here reminding everyone that Arctic cooperation will always go on, reminding us of the 1987 Gorbachev zone of peace speech, 
In the summer, the price of oil is starting its decline and then crashes inevitably. And the future of Arctic oil projects relying on this high price to justify investment is suddenly questioned. There are climate concerns that ring louder as well as the world is preparing to sign the Paris Agreement, which will mark the new era in international climate cooperation. In 2015, my personal tragedy, Professor Rachel Lorna Johnston, my now friend and inspiration, publishes a book on offshore oil and gas in the Arctic under international law, which was basically the title of my PhD, making me think that this is it. My professional career is over. On the actual reading of the book, I find that there can be more than one work on a specific subject with different scopes, a good lesson for anyone undertaking their PhD to learn. Canada hosts an Arctic Council ministerial in Iqaluit. Diplomats are discussing scientific cooperation in reducing emissions of short-lived climate forces, enhancing the safety of offshore operation, ecosystem-based management, climate adaptation. There's a project on renewable energy in the Arctic presented to the Council, resulting later in development of the Arctic Sustainable Energy Toolkit and the Renewable Energy Atlas. In September, Shell abandons its drilling in the waters of Alaska after spending years and $7 billion on this development. 2016, Canada and the US place a five-year moratorium on new drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic waters. Greenpeace and Young Friends of the Earth Norway file a historic legal case against the Norwegian government challenging the granting of oil drilling licenses in a newly opened area in the Arctic. In 2017, I finished my PhD somehow. I start working um, in Aberdeen as a lecturer, integrating my Arctic research into my teaching. There is another uh, Congress of Arctic Social Sciences held in Umia in Sweden. The sun does not set until about 3.30 a.m., only to rise 40 minutes later. Um, there's a movie shown at a conference called Sami Blood by Amanda Kernal. Um, a film about a boarding school for Sami children in Sweden, not leaving um, a dry eye in the audience. Polar Code enters into force, enhancing requirements for vessels that are passing through um, waters in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And in Norway, um, Goliath Field starts its production, the first in the Norwegian Arctic offshore. There is a ministerial in Fairbanks uh, in Alaska, uh, an agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation is signed, a landmark agreement. The Council, uh, in its declaration, reiterate the need to improve the access of Arctic communities to clean, affordable and reliable energy sources, including renewables. They recognize the potential to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions, black carbon emissions to enhance energy efficiency and conservation and welcome a number of renewable energy initiatives in the Arctic. And now we're 2018, China releases its white paper on Arctic policy, sending security scholars and commentators into temporary overdrive. Uh, the narrative of near Arctic state is there. Um, the policy highlights amongst other things, the importance of energy cooperation and mitigation of climate change. Maersk send their first container ship through the Northern Sea Route. Um, I have my daughter and the Arctic Energy and Climate Corporation loses in competition for my attention to nappies and sleeping and feeding schedules. And 2019, here we are, and we thought that was a breakdown in the Arctic Corporation uh, with the infamous Pompeo speech uh, in Rovaniemi, or shall I say rent, um, saying that... Uh, Trump has a commitment to environmental stewardship and raising concerns of Chinese activity in the region. I'm on maternity leave watching in horror for the first time as the Arctic Council left the ministerial without a consensus, without a declaration. There is a, a big dispute over whether to include climate change into the documents, which is just bizarre and surreal. Uh, the IPCC at the same time publishes a special report on ocean and cryosphere affirming the anthropogenic causes of the Arctic substantial sea ice loss and permafrost thaw, um, giving very um, concerning projections for the future and uh, emphasizing the need for rapid and substantial decline in greenhouse gas emissions if we want to preserve Arctic as we know it. 2020 is definitely a year we all wish we could skip, uh, but I would just like to highlight the Norwegian Supreme Court ruling in People versus Arctic Oil case deciding in favor of the government, supporting the award of licenses. And we heard some discussion of this case 
um, on the first day of this conference too. 2021, there is another judgment by the Norwegian court, this time on renewables. And the court rules uh, in the case about the wind farm in Fossen, stating that their operation indeed violates the rights of Sami reindeer herders, landmark ruling finally acknowledging the importance of indigenous cultural practices under threat from energy development project. Sacrificing communities in favor of the greater good has come hand in hand with renewables, including in the Arctic. But for a truly just transition, renewables in the Arctic and elsewhere should not be repeating those mistakes. COP26 is held in Glasgow and uh, AMAP and ACAP host a cryosphere pavilion in the main venue. Um, there are events in permafrost, climate justice in the Arctic, um, indigenous cooperation, ocean acidification. I'm bumping into a few people I met at conferences in previous years, realizing I am perhaps now a regular as well. I have to sit on the floor from time to time because the pavilion is always so full. Iceland concludes its chairmanship of the Arctic Council and passes the baton to Russia. And now we're in 2022, uh, and after the Arctic Council suspended its work following the invasion, many hot takes emerged on what the future of the Arctic cooperation will look like, what shape would it take. There are attempts to place moratoriums on Russian oil, less enthusiastically so on gas. Finland and Sweden begin the process of uh, NATO accession, making it difficult to imagine the future where Arctic cooperation continues in the way that we have seen it before. And just two days ago, the Arctic Council 7 announced the limited resumption of the work in the projects which do not involve the Russian Federation, causing, of course, the Russian side to comment that any decision on behalf of the Arctic Council taken in this format would be illegal as they violate the consensus principle. And here we are at an impasse. Arctic cooperation without Russia is undeniably less meaningful with Russia currently impossible. I cannot help but think back even further than 10 years to that Gorbachev speech and to the change the new leadership brought. To more recent times to this Pompeo speech and the change the new leadership in the US uh, brought. I think about my Russian colleagues, many of whom lost their international research cooperation, but still reach out to me to ask how I was, if my family was safe. I think about what future Arctic cooperation, energy security and climate action will look like. The Arctic oil discourse is facing decline and a fair challenge from climate activists. And I cannot really see it returning to its former glory, even with a oil price rebound. Arctic gas, very much still there, but with big question marks over the geopolitical effects on the energy markets. I hope future Arctic energy cooperation revolves more around climate justice, around renewables, providing sustainable energy sources to local communities, freeing them from relying exclusively on expensive and dirty diesel. I hope economies in a fossil fuel dependent places in the Arctic and elsewhere, including Aberdeen, are diversified in providing its inhabitants with reliable and sustainable and sufficient sources of income outside of the extractive boom and bust cycle. And I believe that the Arctic research community, including many brilliant early career scholars we heard from over the last couple of days, and the seasoned experts who have seen it all, will continue working together against all odds and challenges to help us maintain peaceful, thriving, and sustainable Arctic. Thank you.